most interactions of human herpes virus infections uh, of human nervous tissues. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for the uh, introduction and thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, present some data what we are obtaining in uh, Rotterdam. In fact, uh, uh, herpes viruses are not uh, emerging viruses, they are not re-emerging viruses, but they are reactivating viruses. And this is the hallmark of uh, latency. So what people have been studying with regard to uh, these herpes viruses is that th there is a link with Epstein-Barr virus and um, MS, but also there is uh, a lot of work have been done on, uh, on MS mouse models, but also the mouse models with regard to latency of herpes, to herpes virus uh, type 1. So this is within the trigeminal ganglia of mice uh, inoculated via the corneal surface um, uh, with HSV1, demonstrating CD4 and CD8 T cells are involved in blocking reactivation, the MS mouse model autoantigens. But what's, what's really the case is that if we look at human diseases and we develop mouse models, we are, can ask ourselves, especially in the neurodegenerative diseases, are they wrong or are they useful and what can we do with these? Well, the most important thing about this is that if we have these diseases, we have to go back to the patient itself, humans. So how can we get these? You can get uh, brain materials, uh, um, what have been, a lot of people have been obtained within 24 hours or 48 hours. But of course, these are uh, very um, um, tissues <coughs> due to hypoxia, necrosis, they are not ideal. So in the Netherlands, we set up an infrastructure, the Dutch Brain Bank, which enables us to get these tissues very shortly after death within six hours. And this is really unique material to study these interactions between virus and host in these uh, diseases. So what we are doing now is that uh, we are studying the immune pathology of MS, so in normal appearing white matter as well as lesions, as well as in the human trigeminal ganglia uh, to identify virus-host interactions with regard to VCV and HSV1. So I will share with you three uh, studies what we performed the past five, uh, three, uh, five years. Um, the time among the antigen specificity of T cells and CSF as well, brain of MS patients. We, we wanted to identify the viral transcriptome because this is really important. If we, if we were looking for a functional cure against HSV1 and VCV, we need to identify the viral transcriptome, what we should can, uh, what we can hit with, for example, CRISPR-Cas technology, and then, of course, antigen specificity at the side of latency. We know that we can't generate sterile immunity, but we can generate therapeutic vaccines to limit reactivation of HSV1 and VCV. So the first study with MS. So we know MS, MS you have genetics, uh, there are other uh, factors, but there are a fair amount of factors, and this is particularly at EBV, what is uh, linked to um, the higher risk of getting EBV. It's an interaction between B cells, T cells, and CNS resident T cells, of uh, CNS resident cells. Uh, a lot of attention has been drawn to outer antigens. Uh, uh, Roland Martin has already published two new antigens what are potentially involved. <laughs> But um, this is all mouse studies or studies on peripheral T cells. So what's going on within the brain of these MS patients? So we generated a, plat so a whole study where we, where we recruit these individuals by life, uh, agreeing to abduct their brains, obtain blood and CSF uh, shortly within, uh, within death. Using MRI, we can really identify the lesions and we can get these biopsies, MS lesions, normal appearing white matter, and CSF blood. We can do immunohistochemistry. We, pump, we reserve part of these tissues for subsequent in situ analysis, but we generate B cells. And the B cells you can generate is EBV. So therefore, you have the ideal antigen presenting cell to look for EBV specific T cell responses. You can transfect them with uh, potential MS autoantigens and of course you can generate T cells. So think about 1,000 T cells, you, you really have to develop a system to get really 50 to 100 million cells. So this is all platforms what we developed in the past uh, 10 years. So this is a complex slide, but this is already refuting the theory, the theory that these autoantigens, so MOG MVP, MOG, so these oligodendrocyte, glia, but also neuronal antigens are truly antigens recognized by T cells in MS lesions. So the dash line means everything above is relevant. So this is not the case. So what's going on then? 
if it's not uh, autoreactive? Is it against EBV? And these are all individual patients. So these are patients with uh, really uh, other neurological disease, cis patients. These are clinical isolate syndrome, uh, very early in the uh, transition to MS, and these are early MS patients. And what you already see is that CD4 and CD8 piece of reactivity is selectively increased in CSS. If you compare the CD4s and CD8 T-cell responses within these patients, you see a coordinate T-cell response against EBV, indicating selective retention and selective involvement of these cells uh, potentially within the brain. So this is what we did. We moved into the brain and asked ourselves, uh, so, the, so these are the donors what we uh, were able to include, asked ourselves, do we see T-cell reactivity CD4 and CD8? You see not a lot of EBV reactivity, but really if you zoom in to the CD8s, and these are the main cell types within MS lesions, what you then see is that they really uh, are predominantly recognized when you're an analyzing chronic active demyelinating lesions. And these are the lesions where patients are suffering from, and these are the sites of real MS. Furthermore, um, Asking people for normal and periodic white, white matter and lesions, sometimes we obtained two lesions from different sides of the brain. And what's very peculiar is that you see then a co uh, so uh, T cell response, the CD8s, in two different lesions within the same brain. Uh, then focusing on the T cell receptor, we identified that there are common clones within these different lesions. And subsequently, if you, free, if you store these tissues, surplus tissues, what you can see now is that you see really, so in lesion one and lesion two, you see these EBV reactive T cells extravasating, but also within the perivascular uh, 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 centers, but also within the veins. So they extravasate and are located in lesion. The diary file transcriptome, VCV as we're sitting here, like, likewise EBV, and almost everybody is affected with VCV. We risk, one out of three of us, risk post-hepatic neuralgia following herpes zoster. So uh, important to get a functional cure is to understand the latency uh, of this uh, virus. Again, moving into um, the peripheral nerve system, you see that these sensory ganglia, you have then the latency of the virus. Well, based on the old dogma, in the, in the, in the last field's edition, uh, it was indicated that there are 10 VCV genes expressed and six VCV proteins expressed. We worked on this and we found that the post-mortem delay of a time of you, when you get these ganglia, human ganglia, determines the amount of VCV genes transcribed and the amount. So demonstrating that after death, VCV tries to reactivate and the machinery of, re of re replication starts. The proteins is also an issue because if you really carefully look at the immunohistochemistry, especially in brain tissues, you always see these A-specific bindings of monoclonal antibodies. So we completely re refuted VCV protein expression uh, during latency and uh, the uh, VCV genes we thought were, were a couple of them. But nowadays we've got RNA-Seq. So RNA-Seq is then sensitive. You can do ultra-deep RNA-Seq. It's more sensitive. But you're talking about a virus where there are limited transcripts. So together with people at uh, UCL, we developed target-enriched ultra-deep RNA sequencing. And this is the transcriptome of a lytic HSV1 and a VCV. And you see that all these genes are, are transcribed antisense sense. So the whole transcriptome be expressed during latency. So this is normal ultra-deep RNA-Seq. These are different patients, so different ganglia. You see the, the, uh, the prototypic latency transcript uh, LAT of HSV1, but we didn't find really something on, on VCV. But if we do, do then target enrichment, and all these, all these uh, circles are really individual trigeminal ganglia from individual patients, you see that the intensity, so the sensitivity is increased. Now you see that the both loads are, are really transcribed, but we see a new transcript. And this transcript is unique. So this transcript is unique for VCV. 
uh, it's, um, it's first task squared that they describe for us, demonstrating it's a spliced transcript. It's encoding for a protein. So this is unique for, uh, for the really uh, uh, alpha, herpes uh, uh, alpha herpes family. But most importantly, it's located anti-sense to off 61. So what about 61? 61 is <coughs> the gene for VCV, what is the transactivator. <coughs> So this is a transactivator <coughs> gene what really is involved in the initiation of replication. So this is in situ hybridization demonstrating uh, LED within these human trigemagania. So these are neurons, somata. This is VCV. You only see a limited number of, of neurons what are latent infected with VCV. But now the function, because you can, you can find everything, but you want to have the function. So if we infect a cell and transfect the cell with, with mature VLT or uh, a, a transcript of, of, or a factor without, what you see then is that the, the expression of OF61 is decreased. So you see repression of 61 expression. But what effect does it have for VCV replication? And this is shown here. So the VCV genome copies, if you transfect the cell and then subsequently infect, you see that VLT is really blocking uh, replication, indicating that this is a key factor of VCV uh, to switch from lytic to latent and from latent to uh, uh, lytic. The third part of my talk is then, you know, a functional cure uh, can be done, but you want to have uh, the therapeutic vaccine as a start. Therapeutic vaccine, you, you, can, you can look for T cells in blood, it's not really relevant. You can look for blood or for T cells within the skin where you have reactivations. This is one of the uh, important, uh, important locations, of course. But we want to see what these T cells are doing at the site of latency. So this is clinical picture. So we are also working with the, uh, with the ophthalmologists in Rotterdam. These are severe, severe issues. So labialis, forget labialis. This is the real thing. And also, of course, HSV and cephalitis. But what's common is that, so these are symptomatic infections. But more common is then really asymptomatic shedding of the virus. So if you ask individuals to swap their mouth once, once daily and then perform PCRs, what you then see in these three subjects that all are really secreting the virus on multiple occasions for even multiple days. So we want to control this. We want to control this asymptomatic shedding, what eventually leads to uh, symptomatic disease. So the place of uh, the, the location of latency, because it's infected via the oral facial route, it's within the trigeminal ganglia. So what we did, like the brain and the MS, you've got a left and a right trigeminal ganglia, and they are really one egg, uh, one egg twins. Identical virus, identical host mechanisms involved, and blood, again, T cell lines generated, B cell lines generated. And then we infected these B cell lines with HSV1 and VCV and just wanted to know what's going on. But first, histology. If you ask a pathologist to, le to look at these tissues, so th this is a whole trigeminal ganglion, and you stain them for CD3, a pathologist in training would say, my God, this is a chronic inflammatory response and this is not good. But in fact, this is what we are taking care of 24-7. So these are T cells helping you out not to get a herpes labialis or an encephalitis. <laughs> Zooming in, you see these agglomerates of T-cells, we call them T-cell coronas, uh, around these neuronal somata. Then if you stain consecutive sections for HSV1 LED uh, within the nucleus, the black, the black uh, nuclei, stain with CD3, you see these enormous agglomerates and they are consisting of CD4 and CD8. And this is fascinating. So there is, again, a collaboration between CD4s and CD8s at these sites. If you stay in further on, and this is also consecutive sections, CD8, coenzyme B, TR1, so these are the CTL markers. In MS patients, if we look at CD8s, what are the main cells within these lesions, they are identical. So they express enormous amounts of perforin, granzyme B, and uh, TR1. However, in MS lesions, they kill neurons. In this setting, we even had uh, donors of uh, uh, one donor with uh, of 99 year old, years old, and it was still a healthy trigeminal ganglion. So, the same CTLs are here, helping you out to control a latent virus uh, and not killing. So, the difference between these T cells is also part of our studies. 
CD137 is an important marker because this is a marker giving us some idea that these T cells are recognizing an antigen locally. And this is what we've done here. So VGV antigens, five, five of these antigens expressed in the B cell and then infecting them with HSV1 and asking these T cells, have these T cells against HSV1 or VGV B in the trigeminal ganglion at site? What we see here are six donors and four of do these donors really react to HSV1, but none of them react to VGV. Ergo, uh, T cells recognize HSV1, but not the selected VGV antigens expressed during latency. So trying to develop targets, identify targets for a therapeutic vaccine, you need to know the antigen. Well, with flu, corona, you have a flu fever, and all the, f uh, the viruses, what I've heard today, are very relatively easy uh, to identify in the T cell and immunologist. But these viruses are far complex. They are more than 80 genes, and some, some have really spliced variants and, and, and new transcripts. So the only thing to figure out what's going on is to generate a complete orpheum express them and then infect cells with all the class one uh, uh, alleles of the respective donor and then screen what's going on. So this is what we did for 12 uh, <coughs> cases. And uh, uh, what you see is then, uh, and th this is uh, really fascinating, it's what we expected that the immediate early antigens would be targeted. But we also see late antigens targeted within the ganglion, indicating that you really have frequent reactivations of which the virus moves from really a uh, very early reactivation phase to uh, almost a full uh, uh, cycle. Uh, then uh, what's the other striking thing is that if you compare individuals, you see, for example, VP16 is recognized by two different individuals, but also ICP6. So these two antigens are really immune prevalent, so they are immune prevalent. And it's not focused for specific class 1 alleles. No, you can see H, uh, if you are an A1 or B40, you recognize VP16. And the other ones, B15, B40, and 31 and 40. So it means that they are immune prevalent targets, but they are also recognized uh, by uh, T cells using different class 1 alleles as restriction elements. So eventually, um, the, what we wanted to know is that you can identify T cells, that's very nice, but you would like to localize them. You would like to know where they are. And this is indicated here. So, so the blue cell, so these are the nuclei, especially the infiltrating cells. The surroundings of the somata are shown here. And then what you see then in green and red is that we can do in situ tetramer staining and to look for these T cells where they are located. And indeed, they are interacting with these neurons of the same donor, really strengthening our idea that they are involved in controlling latency. So important, I think, for studies on neurotropic viral infections, it's animal models are, of course, very useful to understand uh, the uh, means and the interaction of cells. But if we want to treat a disease, we really have to go to human CNS tissues and identify what's going on. So we demonstrate here that uh, the EBV-specific T cells are there early in disease and late in disease. We ask ourselves, are they involved in pathogenesis? We identified a new field, uh, a new transcript, a unique transcript, and this is really a potential uh, gene to target novel chickenpox vaccine. So we now we have a beautiful Shingrix vaccine by GSK. It can protect 79%. Uh, 97%, even uh, in 70 plus individuals with a follow up time of five years. So it's a very beautiful virus to prevent or disaster. But we are still uh, working with a very old fashioned VOCA strain, live that generated the virus strain, but can reactivate. <coughs> so establish in children vaccinated and can establish uh, 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 reactivation. T cells are there within human trigeminal the ganglia. But important then in these type of studies is that you identify the antigens, and these anti antigens can be used um, uh, for uh, as a potential subunit vaccine to protect against severe HSV1 uh, uh, symptomatic disease. So I would like to end here, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you.